Welcome to the One Haas Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Lee, and today I'm joined by Sahar Youssef, a faculty member here at the Haas School of Business. She teaches a popular elective called Becoming Superhuman on the Science of Productivity and Performance. She continues to research on campus in the areas of neuroplasticity and psychopharmacology. Welcome to the podcast, Sahar. Thanks, Sean. It's really great to be here with you. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, you know, I recently finished your class, uh, which I loved. And the one thing I was curious about this whole time was what made you go into this field? You know, it's not something I think undergrads think about or know to go into the area of neuroplasticity, right? I had a fascination pretty early on with the concept of consciousness, human consciousness, more philosophically. To me, I've always loved science, but I wanted to understand how the universe worked. I wanted to understand how everything worked and operated. But I, mm. I had this realization that everything, learning, learning physics, learning chemistry, learning math, all of this is seen and understood through the lens of the human brain. Right. Really, the universe, in the way in which we perceive it, our reality really presides above our shoulders. Mm -hmm. We are constantly wearing these rose-colored glasses, so to speak, perceiving and processing the outside world, everything from society to business to, to again, the laws of physics even. All of this is really being processed through the lens of human consciousness. Right. So if I want to really understand the entire universe, the first step is really to understand the brain and the mind. Mm. So I was initially interested deeply by the concept of consciousness, where human thought comes from, belief, feelings, all of these different phenomena in the human brain. And then quickly within the first couple of years of, of actually starting out in philosophy, in the philosophy of mind, realizing that very quickly you hit a brick wall mm. in that field. If you're trying to understand consciousness, you can't really do it from an armchair mm. with a chalkboard right. and a piece of paper. And I had a, a faculty member that I was working with very, very early on in my undergraduate in philosophy who had the, the, the foresight and the wisdom to say, Sahar, you got, you got to go to neuro. Mm -hmm. You got to get into a lab. You're asking questions that we do not have the answers to. And we're not going to get to the answers sitting here in my office, right. you know, with a bunch of books, you know, collecting dust. It's not going to happen. And you're, you're young enough. It's not too late. Just switch gears. And so I did. I still remember the first day I sat in on my first cognitive science class and I I got a chill down my spine when I, on the screen, we first got an introduction to neurons mm -hmm. and the human brain, a basic introduction, and very quickly transitioned to talking about Descartes mm. and the original sort of the Cartesian problem, you know, I think, therefore I am. Mm. And th those two things, those two worlds marrying together in that moment was just really exciting to me in a way that I had not been excited by any other field or area of study. And then once I got hooked on, into neuroscience and I was like, I'm dedicating my life to this field, I joined a lab and I became very intrigued by how the human brain evolves and how it adapts to its environment yeah. and how the human brain could potentially become better. And so started out actually in psychopharmacology, so applying pharmaceuticals, some sort of drugs, increasing and decreasing different levels of neurotransmitters in the brain to see how and in what ways performance is really impacted. Everything from memory to attention to information processing speed. Right. And then after a few years of that work, I became intrigued by the question really, what can we do? What are the limits non-invasively? What can we teach? How can we train a human brain and a human being to be better, to increase performance in attention, memory, and information processing speed. You know, this is why the class is called Becoming Superhuman. How do we make superhumans without the drugs? Right. And I remember, or this was, uh, I don't know if you remember that movie, uh, Limitless mm -hmm. with Bradley Cooper. Yes. It's the idea was, um, and, you know, as someone who used to study psychopharmacology, I remember going to conferences and people would say, what's, you know, the elevator pitch of what your research is all about? And I'm like, you've ever seen the movie Limitless? And they're like, yeah. And it's like, it's kind of like that, less exciting, no Bradley Cooper. <laughs> <laughs> but but the, the, new, the new motto became, how do we become limitless without the pill? Mm -hmm. And that became, you know, for the past 10, 12 years, my obsession. 
So that you end up running the gamut studying meditation and attention training. You study what the Department of Defense has been doing for years, trying to train, you know, super soldiers. Everything from rehabilitation research to research on focus and and multitasking, which is, you know, you're familiar with this. This is what we end up diving into in the class as well. What made you curious about the human consciousness? I think it was curiosity. I think I became fascinated at an early age by perspectives, perspectives and perceptions. I grew up actually here in the Bay Area, Mm -hmm. so I'm a local, but to parents who uh, were recent immigrants from Iran Mm -hmm. post-revolution. And so they didn't speak English. So I grew up bilingual, but very confused about my bilingual status. So I don't think I was fully onboarded to the fact that I speak two languages and I seem to swing between them rather naturally at a young age. So I had no idea sometimes at school that if I spoke a certain way, I was lost in translation there. I'd come home, I was lost in translation there. And I quickly realized, I think, growing up that so much is fundamental to being human. And it doesn't matter where we're from, Mm -hmm. what we look like, we're all the same in so many ways. But there's there are aspects to our upbringing and to our perspectives that become shaped in time. So I suppose it's this nature versus nurture aspect that my personal experience with this intrigued me to wonder what's different about my my brain than anyone else's and what things are the same. So tell us more about your PhD studies. What, what did you do after you graduated Berkeley undergrad? Did you immediately go into your master's and PhD? I spent a year working in uh, a lab on campus. And in that year, I I think I was considering all options. Literally every option was on the table. I, at one point in time, considered opening up a coffee shop where I could discuss everything from philosophy to pure mathematics with other academics and just, you know, make espresso for them in cappuccinos. <laughs> I thought about going into medical school. Uh, but had to really embrace the fact that I really don't like blood. Mm. So that was going to be a bit of a bottleneck. Me neither. <laughs> <laughs> but I really, everything was was open for me. I, I wanted to become an entrepreneur. I wanted to continue doing research. I, really, everything was open and up for discussion. But at the end of the day, after many, many months of self-reflection, I had to truly accept the fact that the one thing I would regret, really, looking back on my life is not pursuing research more fully. That I can always go back and become an entrepreneur. I can always do move into that category, you know, move into that line of work. I can always open up the cafe of my dreams. (laughs) You know, when I'm when I'm 80 years old, maybe, and I have nothing better to do. (laughs) But right now is really the time for me to be of service to take my mind at its peak at its peak performance in its youth, and to really offer up my mind to, in the best way that I see I can, really, the best way I can really be of service to the rest of society, which if you're already knee deep and and educating yourself in a certain topic, and you have the bandwidth to be a scientist, to push our understanding of what human beings are capable of, to cure a disease, let's say, to do any kind of research, really. I think that research is a noble field, and I, I commend all other scientists and researchers who, who dedicate themselves to that kind of work because it's a, it's a lonely job. It's a scary job. Yeah. It's a, it comes with a great amount of failure, mm-hmm. which I know many fellow Hossies, especially those who are in entrepreneurship, understand deeply. You don't get a lot of pats on the back. Mm. <laughs> And you're playing the long game, yeah. really. You can spend years in the lab with nothing to show for it. But it is a, it's a noble thing to do because you're doing something that hasn't been done before. Right. And to that point, to definitely follow up on that, what can you share with us some of your research? So most of the research that I conducted during my, my PhD studies were dedicated to enhancing cognitive performance and function and doing that in two different populations in not only populations that are traumatically brain injured mm. and this was work done with the VA so these are these are students actually at Cal that were either traumatically brain injured from uh, service in the military mm. 
or through some form of um, an accident. So concussed students. Uh, many of them were also student athletes. Right, right. And the goal for both populations, the other population being healthy, high-performing students, was to enhance cognitive function as much as possible. It was a very, I would say, especially for that second group, an almost sci-fi laughable. I remember I actually had a, a Stanford faculty. I gave a talk early on in my graduate work at Stanford to a, a medium-sized group. And I had a faculty member sort of laugh off the entire thing. This was at the early stages of the work. And, and he was pretty much like, no, this is not going to work. You can't take a 23-year-old, you know, 4.2 GPA, UC Berkeley undergraduate who is at the peak of his or her health and cognitive function, and they're already at the upper echelon, the cream of the crop in terms of national averages, right. and then arbitrarily just raise the roof on their performance. This is, you know, it's not, this is not a sci-fi movie. And then my sort of rebuttal to that was that if you look incrementally at all of these different avenues, again, outside of pharmacology work, non-invasive, what small things, small adjustments we can do to the human brain. How, look at how much memory can be enhanced if we just remove distractions. So, and if we can enhance memory, then we can potentially also be impacting information processing. Like there's all of these different nuts and bolts that if we can just hone in and really teach people how to work, how to study, how to focus, how to focus longer, how to focus better, uh, managing stress, redirecting attention when it wanders away, all of these little you know, tips and tricks, really the kitchen sink, truly, I would say, mm. of every type of biohack or uh, tactic that you, can, that you can utilize in the pursuit of the highest performance possible for your cognitive abilities. If we just put them all together, I think that we can raise the roof. And yes, it's a little sci-fi, but I'm pretty sure it'll work. And, and it did. <laughs> so... We had a seven-week training program, uh, which was uh, a class, actually, on campus. And we had students just going through this, this classroom experience in small batches. And every single week, they would come in and they'd have homework where really they were just using the techniques taught in the classroom and applying it to their schoolwork, to, uh, to their jobs if they had them, doing things like making sure that they were sleeping better, eating healthy, meditating, et cetera, but really just applying all of the best practices. And in seven weeks, lo and behold, we saw significant improvements across the board for so many different cognitive metrics that are typically unmoved in a short amount of time. So right. this, was, this was, an exciting, it was an exciting finding. So the question at the end of many years of doing this research was, now what? How do we take this out into the world? Because otherwise, you know, I can... Sure, write a publication and it will, you know, collect dust on a, other academics' desks <laughs> around the world. But, but how do we actually help people with this? How do we impact the world? Yeah. So what did you guys do next after you uh, graduated, <laughs> after you got your dissertation approved? <laughs> <laughs> At that point in time, my life forked. I uh, wanted to be able to teach because I love teaching. Mm. And I see that as, as long-term having the most fun impact that I could have in the world, doing what I love doing, and also just being in service of our, our students on campus. Right. So I wanted to continue teaching. I've been lucky enough to take uh, a faculty position at Haas to be able to do that. And uh, the other fork is really taking this research and applying it out uh, in the world, boots on the ground with teams, with executives, with departments and companies around the world that want to be more productive and work in line with their biology. So the, the goal is always more productivity, but not to say we should just become workhorses and work more hours. It's always going to be more productivity, but with less mm -hmm. so that folks can actually live their lives. That's always, that's my, that's my sort of secret goal is to make everyone superhuman and make them really, really effective and efficient at getting their work done and their best work done so that they can then take what is left of their energy, left of their brain power and left of their time in the day and then do what is most important to them. And typically that's not going to be their work. <laughs> do you see differences in your clients from say the student body to company employees to executives, what are the differences that you see amongst these groups, if any? Or are, is it the same problem and the same solutions for all of them that your research can apply? Mm, that's a, a phenomenal question. Uh, I would say 
The differences I have predominantly been able to measure and see is not necessarily in seniority. I would say the only differences I see in terms of seniority from, let's say, a CEO mm. to an IC that has just started out of out of school. The CEO just might be more readily accepting of their limitations because they have no choice and they may have more regrets in the way that they have spent their time in their life. Interesting. So, And you see the, the fresh out of school, highly energetic and highly ambitious folks. They're the ones that will unfortunately make the mistakes of burning themselves out and spending way too much time working and burning the midnight oil. And then they'll just regret it once they reach the seniority level. <laughs> I'll just see those same students 30 years from now and they go, whoops. <laughs> so I don't see much difference there in terms of seniority and rank. Yeah. However, I do see differences in, in role, I would say. So an engineer, senior or otherwise, versus a sales professional or someone who's in business development, you see just different sets of issues. Mm -hmm. they, they will burn out in very different ways. They will make different mistakes. And productivity for them is also going to be wildly different. Right. So that is where we there's some customization to, I would say, taking the best practices, again, from biology, but customizing it to those fields. So for an engineer, let's say, or for someone who's an R&D or a, a data analyst, the goal will be to carve out as much quiet, focused, isolated time as possible so that they can do their best work and actually get into flow and and create in a way that, again, is in line with how the brain best operates. And that's not going to be multitasking in tiny chunks and allowing themselves to get interrupted constantly. Hmm. For a sales professional or someone in business development, let's say, if you are client-facing, then the marker of success really for your work and your productivity many times is attached to you managing and maintaining high levels of energy and mental clarity throughout the day mm -hmm. for as many hours of the day as humanly possible. They don't have off periods. They need to be able to go game on mentally at, a, at the drop of a hat and for far more hours than the rest of us really do. So for that particular group, for those individuals, we focus heavily on energy management energy management and creating uh, cognitive routines and associations to get them almost like p professional athletes into and out of certain brain states reliably. Wow. Whereas, for, again, for engineers and, and knowledge workers, it's wildly different. You know, we, we are during this COVID period, during this pandemic, what are some of the tactics and, and advice that you have for folks to avoid burnout? Now, I understand there, there probably are different tactics for different roles. But what are some general ones that you think are really helpful and useful? Mm. I think the number one is especially if folks don't have a history of working from home. So you have found yourself newly working from home. You now find yourself, your brain finds itself rather confused as to what is happening in terms of the boundaries of work and home life. I'll talk briefly about how the human brain really works. The human brain is really just an electrical system. Mm. And the way that the human brain works are through what are called neural networks. And these are just patterns of electrical activation in the human brain. Now, the human brain is constantly looking to its surroundings to stimuli in the environment for cues as to which neural networks should and should not be activated. Now, our behavior, which is what we see on the outside, and it's how we think and feel as well, all of that is a downstream effect of which neural networks are electrically activated in the human brain. So if you really think about what we had before, which was you would wake up in the morning in your home. Your home, if you think historically, in terms of the percentage of memories that you have in your home, think about what percentage of those memories is associated with rest, relaxation, fun, play, time with loved ones, shared meals, cooking, cleaning. Right. This is what our homes are associated with. Those are the neural networks that have been activated and reinforced over and over and over again for years. You would leave those associations and physically commute to an office right. or to campus. Once you're in the, that new environment, you have an entirely new set of stimuli. You wear different clothes. You have different triggers in the environment different individuals that you don't live with in your home, right. all of those, those environmental stimuli activate an entirely different set of neural networks. Mm. 
And then at the end of the day, you leave that and then you come back home. Then those neural networks are turned off and deactivated and then the home ones are reactivated again. Well, now that we're all sheltering in place and stuck at home, your brain has no idea what is going on. It's confused. All of the different networks are becoming active at the same time. So you're sitting in your living room and let's say for decades, you're looking at your couch across the hall and your living room is associated with all of these memories of playing board games or watching TV with your family. But then all of a sudden you're like, no, 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 it's go time. And I'm in a very heated meeting with, you know, a a colleague right now on Zoom And your brain is completely muddled. So electrically speaking, this is quite physiological. Your brain has like multiple neural networks being activated at the same time. So the number one, I would say, piece of advice I would would want to give to anyone listening is to start to create boundaries, not just physical boundaries, but mental and cognitive boundaries around work and home mode. Do anything you can. And, and and quite honestly, and it might sound silly to do this, but many times the solutions don't look elegant, but they do work. You can literally cover your dining room table or your kitchen table with a tablecloth or an old t-shirt. And then all of a sudden you're introducing a new stimulus yeah. and your brain goes, oh, huh, that's new and weird. We don't usually put t-shirts on the table. So you're trying to create kind of a mental clean slate for your brain so that mm. your brain goes, oh, no, 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 this isn't my dining table. This is not my kitchen table where I share meals with my family. No, no, this is something else. This is something different. And then you have an opportunity to design those neural networks and associations that are in that environment. This is, of course, if you're low on space. If you have lots of space, I mean, repurpose a closet, work in, (laughs) to grab a corner and and set up a workstation for sure. But do as much as you can to really create ramp up routines and ramp down routines. Like have a song that you listen to that marks the beginning of the day. So Mm. your brain hears that and goes, it's go time. Now it's work and it's no longer home. And then have a song that you play when it's time to just unplug and your, your day's done. And then no more work after that. You just have to make sure that these boundaries are kept clean and clear. You have to be very disciplined with this. Otherwise, it won't work. This is huge. I mean, this is huge even for me as a, as a you know, stay-at-home dad, entrepreneur. Even having been an entrepreneur for over 10 years now, it's still something that I constantly struggle with. And I think it's because I don't create these boundaries. And I didn't really grasp what these boundaries meant until how you just described it from a uh, physiological standpoint in that, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but effectively you're chunking your neural networks. And is it when you have all these things muddled, now it's just these different chunks trying to connect with each other because they think they're, they should be associated when they shouldn't be associated. And that creates this massive confusion, right? That's a beautiful summary. No, that's absolutely right. And so so for, for me, Sean, I have historically, as a researcher, I work from home a lot of the time. I, my work is portable. I have data on my, my computer. I can bring it home and analyze it. There's no reason for me to be in, in a certain place or in, in an office. Right. And I have created so many different disciplined routines around making sure that when I'm working, even if it's in my home, that my brain knows when it's time to be off and on. And there are a lot of different things you can do. There could be a work shirt that you wear and then you make sure you never wear your work shirt when it's it's time for you to relax in your house. There could be a beverage or a mug that you use only when it's work time and you don't use that mug when it's now time to unplug during the weekend, let's say, for example. Right. Um, It doesn't have to be a location, you know, especially if you're low on space. I'll give you another example that I've used reliably. This is now a, a weird personal anecdote. Uh, and this is actually from my, my, my PhD years. For over 15 years now, I have consistently, when analyzing data, listened to very obnoxious German and Swedish like techno music. Huh. It's the same playlist. <laughs> I listen, like Bass Hunter comes on and my brain knows what's happening. <laughs> It's time to get into that headspace and I want to see numbers and I want to see code. But I make sure that I never listen to that music outside, mm. even though I do I do rather enjoy it. So if even if I want to feel a little bit more high energy, I make sure that I keep that association very clear. And now reliably, after 10 years of reinforcing that neural network, even if I don't feel like getting focused, productive work done, the moment I hear that that playlist and it's the same playlist with the same order of songs for 10 years, 
that it's like I'm like a Pavlovian dog. It's like that music comes on and I will ju- I will even if I'm tired, I get into that headspace. And I have a playlist for when I want to crank through emails as quickly as possible. I have different playlists for different things. I have a a playlist that I listen to when I'm trying to unwind. Mm. And I keep all of these very neatly, you know, clean and and tidy and I make sure not to cross list them. And this is just a way that I help myself get into and out of certain brain states. But you're absolutely right. We need For those of us working from home, you need to be extra mindful of this because your brain just, yeah, it, it has no idea. You're sitting down to try to work on, let's say, a proposal, put a proposal together, put a deck together, and all of a sudden you remember, it's like, oh, I need to get milk. Right. Or we're running out of you know paper towels. I got to get on Amazon. And yep. that's only because those, those neural networks are now completely, I would say, associated inappropriately. Yeah. Well, that makes so much sense. My life has changed once again. <laughs> I, I, I have something new to implement and try out how you know my, my assumption is that it takes about 30 days right as they say to train a new habit how long do you from your research how long does it take to create these new boundaries mm, i would say it takes more it can take more or less but probably more okay that the whole every time i see one of those oh it takes 21 days or 60 days or 30 days to create a new habit i just find that slightly silly it would be so if you kind of reposition the definition of the human brain, really just take it out of the black box. It's not all that mystical. If you really start to see the brain, although it is a little bit of a simple oversimplification, but I think it's a useful one, especially when we're talking about neuroplasticity. If you really start to see the human brain as a muscle or a set of muscles, that's like saying to yourself, can I get fit in 30 days? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And can you get closer? Yes. Oh, yeah. You can make some strides. It really just depends how disciplined you'd like to be. Right. So if you are very, very disciplined about retraining, let's say, a neural network, and you work on it every single day, day in, day out, maybe multiple times a day, you are going to see a massive improvement in 30 days. Is it over in 30 days? No, of course not. You have to continue to reinforce it. So it's a lifelong commitment, just very similar to fitness, which I know is probably sad for folks to hear. <laughs> they kind of hope I, this is the part where it's not like the limitless pill. It's, <laughs> it's not a pop one and done kind of thing. These are just uh, habits that are that need to continue to be nurtured, just like plants. You have to continue to water them and be disciplined and prune them when they start to get unruly. So. You know, if you if you all of a sudden notice there's bleed over effects where you're allowing yourself, let's say, when you're laying down in bed to start thinking about work or you're yeah. not thinking about strategy when you're uh, when you're trying to fall asleep at night, it's like, uh oh, that's pruning. You need to get up and get out of bed. You have to make sure that lying down in bed is never associated with work if you want to keep those boundaries also clear. Otherwise, you'll have trouble sleeping 10 years from now when you lay down and put your head down. Your body has no idea, your brain has no idea what is appropriate or inappropriate thoughts and behavior. You want to make sure that when you lay your head down on your pillow, your brain says, oh, I know what's happening. There's only one, like one to two options. It's either sleep or sex. That's it. (laughs) (laughs) But besides that, you know, this is not time for the third S, which is strategy. You know, (laughs) this is not time to to think about emails or reflect on, you know, what my week looks like, because otherwise you're going to have muddled associations with your bed as well. How do you advise somebody who has many muddled associations for people who've just blended their work and their personal life? How do people even start? Because it can feel overwhelming. In terms of where to start, my advice is always when trying to initiate behavior change or any type of even biological change or organizational change, actually, you always begin with leverage points in a system. So that's going to be always going to be the philosophy in a, in a systems approach. Leverage points are defined as small changes or areas in which we can focus that are high leverage. That if you were to make this one small change, it would have the biggest impact. So I would say, and I'll give you a few examples. For one person, that could be I have, I'm, I'm starting to approach burnout because I find it very difficult to turn off at the end of the day and I'm finding it difficult to fall asleep reliably and I'm just not feeling well rested. Well, then at, I would say let's focus in on creating clear boundaries for when it's time for you to turn off. And the moment you start to get thoughts, work-related thoughts, when it's time to be off, you have to be very diligent and not allow those thoughts to come in. Redirect your attention to something else. Have a routine associated with redirecting the, your attention from the work-related thoughts back to rest again. And be diligent about, let's say, the bed example that, that we went over before. 
For those that are finding it difficult to get into a focused mode and be productive while at home, I would say that's the leverage point. Then you need a ramp up routine. You need a routine that you know creates a clear boundary so that you don't feel like it's Netflix and chill time when you should be really working. So I would say just focus on where you think you'd have the biggest improvement really in your own life. And it's going to be different for every person. Can you share with us a bit about your work outside of Haas? The work I do outside of Haas is both, I would say, the most challenging part of my daily weekly rhythm, but also the most fascinating because I get to see these somewhat theoretical concepts and strategies actually implemented in messy ways in real organizations. (laughs) I get to take uh, an idea or a methodology and actually go and deploy it with humans, which by the way... As a biologist, humans are the messiest pieces of data. I can't contain a human being in a Petri dish or in a lab. They're out in the world. They're messy. (laughs) It's messy data to begin with. And then you just, you take it out there into the world and you say, well, let's see how this plays out. Let's see what humans really do with it. So that's actually what I've noticed. the most fascinating thing. You know, we develop methodologies of working that will not only increase productivity, but decrease stress. That is always the goal and increase energy as well. So it makes Mm. folks happier, healthier, and more productive. That's that's always the goal. And then we take these methods and then implement them in customized fashions with teams out in the world, all around the world. And what's interesting is, again, yeah, what they end up doing with it. But knock on wood, it continues to work uh, beautifully. And I'm always, I am always both honored and fascinated by the creative ways in which executives, their teams, managers, ICs, take these concepts and really make it their own. And that is, I would say, the most fun fun piece of it is helping them reimagine what work can look like for them and seeing the downstream positive effects of that and, and really being a part of, like really rolling my sleeves up as a faculty member and saying, I'm off campus, I'm, I'm here with you and we're going to figure out how we're going to make this work. That's so inspiring. Thank you so much for being on the podcast today. This was truly a pleasure. Uh, We can't wait to have you back. I can't wait either. This was so much fun. Thank you for taking me down memory lane and, and asking so many insightful questions. This was wonderful. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the One Haas here at Haas Podcast. If you enjoyed our show today, please subscribe to us on your favorite podcast player and give us a rating or review. You can also check out more of our content on our website at onehaas.org, where you can also subscribe to our monthly newsletter. Until next time, go Bears!